Morning, everybody, and happy Monday. My name is Jake Milstein. Welcome to this uh, urgent panel webinar. Um, we call it an urgent panel uh, because we throw it together really quickly when there's a new vulnerability or something geopolitical happens in the world. If you haven't joined us for these before, you know, these these all came out of um, I forget what the first one was. Um, but what happened, Tyler Technologies, I think Tyler Technologies, and that's, that's right. And one of our municipal customers said, Hey, I, I like, I need to know more about this. And then we heard from another customer, I need to hear more about this. Um, and so we put together an urgent panel webinar to talk, uh, to talk about it. And people came away from it saying, Hey, that was really great. Uh, you know, spending an hour with you all to hear about it. Uh, hear, hear about this thing has been really helpful to me. And, uh, and, and, and so anyway, so here we do. So you have sort of two kinds of urgent panel webinars. Ones are ones where, you know, we bring on a, 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 a team and we talk about a whole bunch of, uh, you know, a whole bunch of topics, like when we're talking about Russia. And then there are ones like today where there's something more technical or we bring on somebody like Bjorn, who you'll, who you'll meet here in a minute if you haven't already met Bjorn. Um, <clears throat> and he actually has a bunch of slides to go through um, for these more technical uh, uh, type of urgent panels. Today, obviously, we're going to talk about this new vulnerabilities and operational technology environments. A um, couple things to know. The chat is on the right. Uh, if you want to say hi, the chat's over there. Uh, let us know where you're joining from uh, and, uh, uh, and say hi. Uh, you can mute the chat if you want. Uh, I'll show you how to do that in a second. You will get a recording of this. If you registered, you will get a recording. Um, we're going to talk about what we know and how to prepare. If you want to mute the chat, uh, you click full screen. Then you click more. Then you click select mute all notifications. And then you click exit. Um, it's okay to click exit. It doesn't mean leave. Leave at the bottom means you leave. Exit just means you exit that screen. So there you go. Okay. Um, who are we? So Critical Insight defends critical services against uh, cyber attacks. Uh, the critical industries we serve include hospitals, utilities, cities, counties that are essential to everyone's daily life. Uh, we're their security operations center and so much more. We watch networks 24-7 to spot and stop attacks so folks can deliver their critical services. That's who we are in case you haven't met us before. Um, more on who we are, Mike Hamilton, Critical Insight founder, former CISO of the city of Seattle. Uh, Bjorn Townsend, we'll be doing a lot of the talking today. He's one of our senior consultants. Uh, he's one of our, he's on our incident response team. Um, he works with a lot of municipalities, works with a lot of water systems, um, and uh, uh, has uh, written a, a couple of white papers for water systems. Um, and so when we saw this vulnerability, actually Bjorn was the first one who saw it, he said, we need to talk about this. Um, my name is Jake Melstein. I'm the Critical Insight event host. Um, I also run marketing, but that's not really important today. What's important is um, uh, is what we're going to talk about. Um, Mike, uh, if you have not met Mike before, one of the other things Mike does is a daily blast where you get emails, an email from Mike every weekday, uh, and Mike reads more news than any of us would ever care to read so that you can get the best. Uh, if you ever want to sign up for that uh, daily blast email, you can do so on our website. Mike, tell us the important headlines about this uh, this vulnerability. Okay, well, the important headlines are, I think, what's driven everybody to um, have such a high interest in this because they just keep coming out. So CISA has been really good about releasing information um, to let people know in advance of things. Sorry, I have a tea cough. So you can see what, what, they've, what they've done is they've enumerated, <clears throat> excuse me, all of the pieces that are involved here. And what they say is this is a Swiss army knife, meaning that it's a whole kit that's designed. And Bjorn is going to go through this in some detail. It's designed to have all the pieces once you have obtained uh, access to uh, a utility network or something like that. It's these pieces that allow you then to burrow into the programmable logic controllers and the other components in your SCADA system. And um, what we fear is that this is just for knocking them down. This is not for stealing your money. This is not for extorting you. This is not for stealing records. This is for making your utility stop working. What it has talked about was... Uh, 
um, that it's been directed at energy utilities, so energy generation. Um, LNG is the one that shows up on this list, but the components that Bjorn is going to go through really kind of underlie the fact that uh, there's, there's a very specific recipe that's been devised for a specific set of technologies. And if you have those technologies, you are probably at elevated risk. So again, CISA is really good about coming out with this stuff. And it was started by the administration and started Ukraine war, where we started to divulge all this intelligence and saying, here's what's going to happen. Here's what's going. Well, every time they were right. So the fact that this has now been discovered, the fact that it has been disclosed by the federal government as a problem means that their anxiety is high, and that's driven a lot of people's anxiety to be high as well. But let's go to the next slide. Uh, I'm not allowed to touch the slides. We uh, verified that as soon as we started here. So again, the federal government's been really good at disclosing th uh, this intelligence, not only to our allies and partners, uh, so that they can plan their next steps in trying to mitigate all the, the disaster going on in Ukraine, but also to let the Russians know that we see them, right? And, and you know, once your plan has been found out, your calculation as to whether or not you're going to pull the trigger becomes different. So, yes, the fact that we've identified all this stuff and we've put out bulletins on here's how you can see this yourself means, yeah, this is detectable. And so it's lost a lot of value to these Russian actors. Again, the reason that it looks at very specific technologies, and again, Bjorn is going to enumerate those technologies, uh, the feeling is that there was actual access to a utility, could have been LNG, could have been some other kind of generation, could have been something. Um, and once inside that network, doing a very careful survey of what was in there and then developing a set of tools that can then be deployed in there and knock this stuff down. And Mike, this isn't the first time we've told, you know, since the Ukraine-Russia oh, no. uh, Russia war started, this is not the first time we've said to Russia, hey, we see you doing something. That's right. That, I mean, that, that was my point. We say that on purpose. And part of that message is for them. It is for the Russians. We see you. And, it, and what this does is it makes their kit then lose a lot of value. The element of surprise isn't there. Attribution has already been done. We don't know how the, accurate that is, but they say this is, you know, a Russian uh, kit. I have no reason to not believe that. So yes, this alert is also for consumption by the Russians. And again, it's not all ICS environments. It's ones that have these specific technologies, but you have to ask yourself, are there others out there that we have not detected where the same kind of effort has gone in to understand that environment, uh, uh, figure out the vulnerabilities there in the components, weaponize those vulnerabilities, deploy exploit, design deploy exploits, and then get ready to pull that trigger. This might not be the only environment that they've done that to. In and then the finally, and the, implies that the, there are others. <laughs> that does. It does because it's so modular. I'm really looking forward to your deep dive on this, Bjorn. Um, and I'll just close with this. When they say, here's all this stuff you need to do, this is all the stuff we all should have been doing anyway. So it shouldn't come as any surprise when they say, change your authentication credentials on your PLCs. Should have been doing that regularly anyway. So with that, Bjorn, I'm going to give it to you and I'm going to mute so they don't cough on you. All righty. So um, this all came out uh, around uh, Wednesday, Thursday last week. Uh, I think the actual formal announcement came out on April 13th. Um, and uh, the way it was announced was interesting. Uh, the announcement came from CISA stating that a new family of malware, not just a single piece of malware, but a, a, a toolkit, um, had been discovered prior to deployment uh, by uh, federal government. Uh, and samples of that malware were provided to a couple of very major uh, cybersecurity firms that do a lot with the federal government. They have strong ties to the intelligence community. They're kind of the go-tos for uh, industrial control system, incident response, and security. And that's Mandiant and Dragos. Um, and uh, the fact that uh, this malware had, quote unquote, never been deployed or had not been deployed yet is very, very interesting. As Mike alluded to, um, the 
when you're attacking an operational technology network, you really have to have detailed understanding of not only how the network is set up from an IT perspective, but the process control systems that are inside that network. You essentially have to s come up with a, a game plan for what you want to do to the process control systems and then work backwards from there in terms of figuring out how to achieve it. And what this makes it look like is that uh, the organization that created this malware, which is believed to be the Russian government, um, had been... Uh, doing reconnaissance of electrical power generation and delivery and uh, liquid natural gas storage and delivery systems and uh, had developed this malware uh, with it in mind. But at the same time, Dragos and Mandian implied that this uh, malware was obtained before it had ever been deployed, meaning that it might have been pulled not from the uh, uh, industrial network in which it was intended to be deployed, but from uh, the infrastructure that belongs to the actual attacker. So in effect that the federal government or some other NATO aligned cyber actor compromised Russian government systems and found this very nasty malware in it and then shared it with private industry partners to uh, get, uh, get their assistance with the analysis of that malware. And uh, Dragos and Mandiant both put out their own reports, which are really good and really interesting. If you're uh, uh, interested in this subject, I highly recommend that you read those in detail because they give a lot of good information uh, and talk about uh, the capabilities of each component of uh, this malware family uh, in a little bit more detail than we're going to have time to get into here. Um, and again, like I said, this isn't a single tool. It's a suite of tools. And the point of this suite of tools is to enable the end-to-end -end compromise of a industrial control system, starting with an IT intrusion in the enterprise network, and then the scenario that everyone has always feared, pivoting to the operational technology network from there. Um, the tools that make up this toolkit are can be mi mixed and matched. They're not all required to be deployed together and you wouldn't need every single one of them for all of the attacks to be successful. Uh, or it, it, it's, uh, some of them are designed to attack particular manufacturers' PLCs. Some of them are designed to attack uh, a, uh, a uh, control system. Others are uh, a uh, uh, command and control system for uh, the malware's ability to communicate with itself within your network. Um, you don't need to bring all of those things uh, to bear on every problem, um, but they they exist and are available to the attacker if they're needed. And that the fact that all of that exists, the fact that uh, they went to all the effort to create all of that extra tooling that wouldn't be needed for just a single attack, that implies that they're heavily resourced and that they have the ability to kind of test these things out on hardware that they have themselves. Um, so it, it definitely speaks to the fact that uh, this was created by most likely a very sophisticated nation state actor and the provenance, uh, Dragos and Mandiant and CISA both seem to agree that it seems to be coming from Russia. So with that in mind, let's talk a little bit about what those components are. And you'll, you'll have noticed that uh, there are two names associated with this malware family. One is Pipe Dream and the other is In Controller. And the reason for this is because Pipe, uh, Dragos and Mandian did their own analyses of this malware completely independently of one another. And their teams came up with their own code names, both for the malware family overall and the uh, individual subcomponents of that malware. Um, this is kind of what I would describe as a, a dance off between their two respective marketing departments in which, you know, whoever's code names get adopted by the media the most and the, the security industry the most. Well, they're going to kind of be uh, the one that uh, most people think of when they uh, think of uh, the analysis of this breach. And uh, they're going to be uh, using the uh, Dragos uh, code names more than the Mandiant code names. At least that is, that's what I've seen so far is that the, the Dragos code names seem to be winning. Uh, so that's of value to security companies because it drives traffic to your website and it makes sure that people read the Dragos report instead of the Mandiant report. But it also causes confusion on the part of defenders because it means that you have to know like that Pipe Dream is also called In Controller and that Evil Scholar is also called Code Call. And you know, you, you can get confused based on whose uh, code names you're uh, you're using. 
Um, so the, the components themselves uh, are pretty interesting. Uh, the first two are both designed to attack different types of PLCs. That's programmable logic controllers. Those are the things that would uh, open and close valves or activate pumps or, uh, you know, uh, actually turning on and, uh, and adjusting uh, industrial control systems in terms of the hardware itself directly. Um, and that this evil scholar or code call, as you might call it, is designed to attack Schneider Electric PLCs in particular. Um, there is a, a, a within evil scholar, there are a, a set of submodules, and each of those submodules could allow you to attack um, different types of underlying protocols that PLCs use, like Modbus. And uh, these protocols are not just used by Schneider Electric, but there is there was in the malware sample that was obtained by Dragos and Mandiant, uh, a library that was ex explicitly intended to uh, attack Schneider Electric PLCs. So the, what that tells us is that the attackers had tried to create a uh, piece of industrial control system malware that isn't just designed to attack the Schneider Electric PLCs for which the code was actually present in the sample, but also uh, to apply attacks to potentially many other manufacturers. Um, so you could drop not just a Schneider Electric library in there, you could drop a Siemens library in there, you could drop an Allen Bradley library in there, you know, anything that uses Modbus or a few other protocols that are common to these things, um, that would be uh, what you might be able to use to attack it with. Uh, if you had some particular attack, attack strategies that you had lined up, as this uh, organization has clearly developed for Schneider Electric. Uh, the next component that I want to talk about is Bad Omen. This one is similar to uh, the Schneider Electric module, except that it's focused on Omron software and PLCs. They work in a, a little bit of a different way, in a slightly different kind of operational paradigm. So it's worth having a separate component for those uh, that is doesn't necessarily share as much code with the Schneider Electric uh, attack tool chain. So those are kind of both equivalent top level uh, attack uh, tool uh, sub toolkits within this overall toolkit that are designed to attack particular types of industrial control networks. Um, there's also another interesting uh, tool in here that's designed to scan uh, operational technology networks and, you know, discover uh, the presence of PLCs and uh, SCADA historians and try to map the uh, the logic and flow of that network. And that's this mouse hole or tag run system. Um, the scanning tool uh, was designed specifically to uh, look at OPC UA, which is a, one of those underlying protocols that I talked about. It can be used to discover uh, these control systems. Uh, another one that uh, we want to talk about is uh, a part of the exploitation chain uh, for how this uh, malware would go from the IT network to the operational technology network. Uh, this lazy cargo component, or as Mandiant gives it the very romantic name, tool which exploits CV 2021-5368, uh, this tool drops a vulnerable motherboard driver. That's an ASRock motherboard driver. And specifically the driver that controls the LED lights on that on that motherboard makes them flash on and off. This is a, a real driver. It's signed by the manufacturer, but it, it happens to be a buggy version that allows um, uh, you to execute code in the wrong area of memory so that you can leave the memory space that your user is allowed to uh, access and uh, jump into other areas of the operating system's memory. This is a perfect tool for deploying things like Mimikatz and then PowerShell Empire to actually get a hold of uh, you know Windows devices and spread throughout a network before you find and attack entry points to the OT network. So this is more uh, around enabling that initial phase where you're attacking the IT network uh, before you make it into the OT network. Uh, last but not least, there is Dust Tunnel slash Ice Core. Uh, and this is what handles com uh, command and control across all of these tools. It's what uh, uh, coordinates the, uh, the commands that are sent to PLCs. It is what uh, would uh, be sending false readings to and from the sensor systems and coordinating all the activity uh, as, uh, as this is all going on. 
So how does it actually like work in practice? Well, uh, like I said, uh, we kind of start with deploying dust tunnel in that enterprise network. Uh, and you would do that by either phishing a user, perhaps compromising a remote access account. A lot of, uh, you know, you don't necessarily have, uh, for instance, in the water system world, the water system operators don't necessarily always have uh, MFA enabled on their uh, uh, VPN accounts. Um, phishing, again, of serious risk. Uh, and there are a number of other ways that we'll get into later that could uh, you know, leap across an air gap to get this in there as well. Um, so you drop dust tunnel in there, uh, and uh, dust tunnel, that uh, uh, driver is going to let you uh, uh, drop Mimikatz that will, uh, it's uh, going to let you pull Windows credentials out of memory so that you can start uh, moving between machines on their network. Um, and then the lazy cargo command and control system is uh, going to be uh, used to deploy rootkits, and uh, then uh, uh, those uh, ideally are going to be on things like the SCADA historian and the control workstations, uh, and giving you the ability to manipulate the tags and control points within those uh, those uh, control systems. Uh, it could also be used to install things like unsigned device drivers on operation operator systems or stations and HMIs, and that would allow you to manipulate the traffic that's being sent between HMIs and field devices. Um, that would be where you would have people interfering with what sensors are telling you. Um, the risk here is that if you are watching what the network is doing, but you are not watching what your uh, your field devices are doing and what they're saying to each other and whether they are communicating with each other at appropriate times. Um, that is kind of how these attacks are going to slip past the, um, the, uh, the, the IT cybersecurity controls that you are normally going to have in place. All those controls are not really designed to monitor uh, PLC communication or HMI and field device communication. Um, the, we're not inspecting the way that uh, PLCs necessarily talk to one another unless you're using a specific type of uh, detection and response service. Uh, you're not necessarily looking at uh, the uh, way that uh, those readings are, are being sent or whether there are any interruptions in communications between uh, PLCs and the rest of the system that could imply that they're being attacked. Hey, Bjorn. Yeah, uh, Cy brings up a, a point in the in the uh, chat here, um, which is, can you just explain what a rootkit is? Uh, a rootkit is a uh, implant is a piece of software that an attacker would put on a system um, that would allow uh, you, if you were to compromise a, a a normal user account, an unprivileged user account, it's something that would allow you to get the privileges of a administrative user on that system. Or if you already have administrative privileges on that system, it might allow you to get back into it very easily. Um, and it looks like we might have uh, lost Mike, but that's he'll okay. He'll be back. Forge on, he'll uh, be sure to rejoin. Um, so then, like I said, if there is an OPC UA server on the system, mousehole would be used to identify and then uh, just brute force authentication against it. OPC UA servers don't usually have a whole lot of password spraying protection. They're not really thinking about that. And indeed, there are a lot of cases where in like field equipment doesn't necessarily even have a uh, single factor authentication. You don't necessarily have a username and password even to enter. It might just kind of accept com commands from anywhere that can connect to it. So that's a problem. Um, even then, the uh, Evil Scholar and Bad Omen uh, rootkits and malware would then be uh, used to attack any Schneider Electric PLCs and Omron PLCs on there. Um, the uh, final objective, really, is to reprogram and potentially disable safety controllers and other machine automation that could prevent bad things from happening. Um, once you disable emergency shutdown systems, uh, you could manipulate the operational environment to be very unsafe. That would be things like uh, overpressuring um, machines or valves, 
you could uh, overcharge or overheat certain systems depending on what kind of operational technology network was being attacked. The idea is that you would not be able to trust any of the readings that are coming from your sensors or your process controls. And you also uh, would be, the attacker would be able to force those devices to exceed the safe bounds of their operating capacity. They would be able to um, present false readings to operators and safety control systems. They would be able to force uh, uh, valves and uh, machinery to move farther than it is necessarily supposed to in normal operating circumstances. It could even apply more force than is normally allowed by safety limitation systems uh, in terms of opening and closing. Uh, either valves or activating pumps or spinning a centrifuge. Uh, there are many, many, many examples of interesting ways that uh, you can use all of these systems to attack uh, a, uh, a industrial process. And the, what you have to kind of do is instead of attacking the process from the IT side initially, you need to be thinking about what you're going to do to that process. What is that what is what is the goal that you're trying to produce? Are you trying to cause a generator to explode? Are you trying to empty a reservoir and then increase the amount of uh, chlorine flowing through a water system so that you can make people sick? Um, lot the examples are manifold and and uh, uh, you know a little bit too too many to go into here, but uh, there are many many things that you can do with this. So, um, like I said. This is a modular and extensible framework. This isn't just one tool. This is really kind of a Swiss army knife that is intended to grow over time to encompass a large uh, set of uh, common industrial technologies. Uh, it's not designed purely with these two manufacturers in mind. It could uh, execute attacks against Modbus, against OPC UA, against CodeSys, against Windows-based systems. All of these uh, things have modules in this, uh, all of those uh, uh, systems have uh, modules within this malware. Um, and just because a particular attack chain was designed with Schneider Electrics or Omron in mind doesn't mean that others couldn't be added. Um, worse yet, it's possible that modules targeting other manufacturers exist, but were not in the particular code base that was shared with Mandiant and Dragos. Um, there is a particular vulnerability that came out last year for Siemens PLCs that are, is particularly grave that allows remote code execution on that uh, PLC. And uh, that is uh, exactly the sort of uh, vulnerability that would allow an attacker to, even if the uh, PLCs were password protected, um, the vulnerability does not require that you authenticate against the PLC to exploit it. So, um, and Siemens PLCs, it's worth noting, they are the most common type of PLC in the world. They have a 31% market share compo compared to, I think, 26% after their next greatest competitor, according to some 2019 figures that I think remain still relatively accurate. Um, so yeah, there I mean, are- I was gonna say, yeah, Bjorn, I, you know, I, I actually saw it was above 40%. Oh, wow. Um, and so I know, yeah, and I know uh, somebody I was talking to last week uh, who emailed said they're one of our partners and said they had uh, uh, one of one of their clients, you know, is 100 percent in that bucket. So, yeah, a big problem for them. Um, I also just want to tell folks Mike's Internet died, so he'll be back when he fixes his Internet. Um, and I want to call out, uh, you know, Jerry here says, you know, talking on the last slide, you know, these points are significant about specialized systems being monitored and managed by traditional tools. Specialized tools for specialized platforms seems to be the rule of thumb here. You see mm -hmm. it that way? Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a very good point. Um, you also really need to have not just cybersecurity knowledge, you need to understand the industrial processes that you're that you're working with. You need to educate yourself about the uh, the way that uh, the safety systems work um, and what safeguards they have. Uh, you need to learn about uh, how those safety systems could potentially be bypassed uh, and what uh, you know the risks are in terms of what would be, like, what are the worst things that somebody could do to industrial control processes in your particular environment? Those are all important things for an IT security person in those environments to understand so that you can understand 
the attack paths and patterns that might be used against you. That'll really help you when you're trying to respond uh, to a potential incident involving this stuff. So uh, I strongly recommend uh, working closely to, with and talking to uh, the operators of these systems, the engineers uh, who run them and uh, who build them, because those are the, this is two groups of people who don't talk enough, and we really need to get them talking more, learning more together, and ideally, I think, getting uh, some uh, shared curriculum uh, in their educations, because uh, these are... Uh, central issues that are important to both groups and they're really um, kind of escalating. <laughs> um, Joe Weiss has also uh, made a, a number of really good points in the uh, in the chat. Um, the uh, as he points out Stuxnet successfully compromised uh, the uh, sensor data for the Natanz uh, nuclear uh, material production plant in Iran. Uh, to uh, overpressure centrifuges uh, that would have um, otherwise uh, been pulled out of service once they behaved in a certain way. Uh, they replayed good sensor data while uh, actually uh, ordering the uh, machines to uh, overpressure and spin themselves faster than, than they were physically able to handle, uh, and it physically destroyed those systems. Um, and as Joe also points out, you can't detect that compromise at the network level. You have to be watching what the sensors are saying and doing and making sure that it resembles reality. Uh, and that is something that, uh, uh, you know, there isn't a whole lot of uh, technology out there that has the capability to do it. It requires both operator vigilance and IT vigilance and some fairly specific detections and and working with your your operators uh, about how you could build those detections into your system is going to be pretty key. Would you see it in the logs? Does it, do they produce logs? Oh, it depends. I mean, they don't have logs on the device because they're too small and not powerful enough. What they're normally supposed to do is relay information to a historian that serves as the log keeper. But if the if they are sending bad information to that historian, then all that gets recorded is the lies. They don't have the capacity to store that themselves. So either you're watching what is being recorded for the historian in the historian and looking for anomalies. Uh, that's that's one they, way that you could could potentially detect this is if you see data that kind of looks recorded or repetitive or too good. Um, but that that might be a little bit uh, you know tricky as far as whether you could actually detect or not. Depends on how well they splice that recording together, I guess. Um, another way that you could uh, start to detect the initial stages of this activity is really by looking at PLC configuration changes and checking those on a regular basis to see if any users that uh, you wouldn't normally expect to be accessing those PLCs uh, are accessing them. Uh, are those connections coming from places that they wouldn't normally like. Normally, it would be an operator logging in from a specific workstation to make those changes. If they, if someone is coming from anywhere else, that's a suspicious event. There are a few things that you can look at on, on the network and, and see happening as these uh, PLCs are being manipulated with, but that's only at the very initial stage of the attack when the attacker is still installing all of their tools on these systems. So that's where uh, you need to be able to kind of look at both of these things, because if you don't catch that initial setup phase where the attacker is installing their tools, then the existing tools that we have to uh, understand these process, um, these processes and the way they're communicating with each other, we may not be able to trust what they're saying to us. So we need to, you know, work with our process engineers to find ways to validate those things. Welcome back, Mike. Yeah, so um, let me, if I've never really, really expressed this before, I hate technology more than anyone in the universe. It, it, <laughs> yeah. you know, hey, I'm going to go voice only because I'm vampiring off a phone right now. Hey, and, and Bjorn, a question just came in from Sai there. You know, can you give us some use cases you've seen on observ observability of behaviors at the um, CC level of an attack? Yeah, so. Um... Indicators that I would kind of be looking for are interruptions in communication where uh, the PLC would stop sending data for a brief period of time. And that might be because it is acti actively having new firmware installed on it at that time and it can't report because it's, it's being overwritten or it's being manipulated in a way that prevents it from responding. Uh, 
that might be a pretty short window. It might just be a few minutes and your operators might think that it is, uh, you know, like if your network uses radio communication to communicate with uh, some of its components, it might just think that there was a transitory loss of signal. That sort of thing happens fairly frequently if depending on the frequency you're on, if a aircraft radar goes overhead, you know, that can stomp the signal out for a minute or two. Um, Let me add so, something to that too. Yeah. Um, because if you're monitoring your environment and you're doing it right, uh, you will have some way of designing a statistical baseline of normal behavior. And then when anything aberrational happens, an alert should go off. And there's a number of vendors that have great technology, Dragos, uh, Armis, have great technology for this stuff, but that's really the key. It's, you, you know, you can say, well, here are the, here are the C2 controllers. So we'll just set up our monitoring and if anybody talks to these bad IP addresses, well, then something's wrong. Well, okay, that's that's the 20th century way of doing it. It's really about this statistical UEBA, you can call it, right? And, you know, the, the newer technologies use machine learning in the background to really develop that statistical baseline, but that's really what it is. Um, and uh, the side issue to that is that uh, from actually I was just watching a, a lecture by Joe Weiss just prior to this uh, this presentation and he raised a, a good point is that a lot of those machine learning models are based on the false data that might be fed to you by your PLCs they're using that data they're not looking for discrepancies in that data so um, there is more work to be done here <laughs> in this space uh, and uh, we haven't uh, you know quite gotten uh, all our ducks in a row as far as, uh, you know, solving that problem, because if the data that is being fed to the machine learning algorithms is itself unreliable, well, then you're just building a baseline that allows room for attackers to get in. So we need to ask a lot of tough questions about how those machine learning algorithms are being developed and how they're being used and whether they really uh, are covering these cases. Um, obviously, the more that Dragos and their compatriots get to, or competitors get to see uh, uh, attacks like this, the more that they will be able to develop defenses to work around it. So I don't want to cast too many aspersions and say that they're, uh, you know, they're, none of their, uh, their machine learning capabilities will be able to detect this stuff. But ask serious questions of uh, anybody who's trying to sell you that stuff. You know, take it with a grain of salt. Of salt. Uh, and, uh, you know, ask them how they can work around these scenarios. All right. Um, I do want to move on to, like, in depth how you could potentially detect this and also the recommended remediations that um, uh, that uh, CISA and uh, Dragos and Mandiant have uh, put forward. Um, so because this malware was found before it was ever placed in a... Uh, a um, vulnerable system. It was, you know, kind of discovered in its development infrastructure. That malware will not, you can't detect it through like hash signatures or anything like that, because prior to deployment, the malware is physically different, well, logically different, actually, from how it will be when it's deployed in the field. There's always some customization that happens before it's deployed to a particular target. That always changes the hash signatures that are associated with it. So that means that we can't just give hash signatures and antivirus descriptors and be able to detect this. We have to use some intelligence to figure out what's going on when it might be happening. So uh, Mandiant and Dragos didn't share any hash signatures for exactly that reason. But what they did give us is a, a set of uh, behavioral detections that we can use to find this activity. Um, their recommendations, and these are all their recommendations, uh, I'm, I'm essentially taking them from the report because I don't have access to this malware. Um, they recommend performing network monitoring with a focus on the east-west communications from the engineer workstations to PLCs and from PLCs to PLCs. Like I was saying, you need to be watching that traffic for anomalies in terms of where it's coming from and where it's going to and, and what users are involved in that activity, because that's where you would catch the lateral movement between workstation and PLC and then from PLC to PLC. Um, you also want to be looking at modifications to PLCs that are occurring outside of maintenance periods. So like normally when you upgrade a PLC or do any changes to the logic, 
uh, you would have a maintenance period associated with that. And it would be, you know, well known to the operators. Well, if anything is happening to those PLCs outside of those maintenance periods, that that could be threat actor, actor activity. And it's important to, you know, have some monitoring and alerting on that. Uh, another thing that you'll want to be doing, like I said, is uh, is monitoring for unusual interactions between the PLCs and non-standard workstations or accounts. Like, you know, those are the the users who wouldn't normally log into those things. Those are the uh, the um, uh, unusual con connections from unusual places on your network and those sorts of things. Um, you also want to be uh, covering specific uh, ports and protocols. There are uh, particular ports and protocols that are being leveraged in these attacks in this particular set of malware. I won't read them all out, but you can see them there on your screen. And of course, they're in the Dragos and Mandiant reports uh, covering those as well. Um, and then you also want to ensure as best you can that for really critical safety system components, you want to ensure that they're isolated on the network. You want to make sure that they are at least, if if not air gap, then at least heavily filtered and firewalled off and segmented um, from your other networks. And make sure that you're monitoring any new connections or new devices that enter those networks very closely and uh, verify all changes to configurations of those systems with your change control and change management procedures prior to let them going ahead. This is all hygiene stuff. This is all stuff that we should be doing anyway. Um, but oftentimes people fall down on their hygiene, they forget to brush their teeth, and they forget to uh, do all these things too. Well, and, my, and Mike, what, what is it you say about a crisis? Don't let a good crisis go to waste, you know, if you haven't been doing it up until now. Absolutely. Now's a good time. This, this should provide all the air cover you need to make some changes. You know, this particular event has got anxiety way up with a lot of people and that includes executives so um and jake were we planning on doing an executive brief for this oh if uh if somebody wants if it'll help somebody for this one okay. uh then we can uh so what we've done typically uh is we we create a word document when there's something urgent that you can then modify uh for your organization if um uh, if people want one, we're happy to create one. Uh, just shoot me an email or put it in the chat and say, yes, I want one for this. Uh, and then uh, and then I'll make Bjorn do it. Yeah, we'll do it. It's it, We'll do it as a, a one pager without all the secret handshake language. All right. Deputy wants it. And so it looks like somebody else just emailed me. OK, we will do that. It's a deal, Jake. But if I ever get to come up with my own code names, I'm going to enter you into dance off. I will, and just so everyone knows, we're going to create our own code name for this. All right, fine. Everybody wants it. We'll have it. We'll have. We'll. We'll. I'll tell you what. So what we'll no no dance off, uh, but what we'll do is we'll create it, and then um, when we send an email to everybody uh, after this, also we'll all add the YouTube link for this in case you want to share the video of this. We'll we'll put both in that uh, in that follow up. Bjorn, keep going. All right, so this is uh, continuing the mitigations, the things that you could do to defend against this. If your PLCs support the ability to set credentials on them, as in if they even have a single factor of authentication available, you want to change those defaults. Make sure there are no default credentials sitting around waiting to be used. Um, on Schneider Electric TM200 series PLCs, you'll want to restrict access to those ports that are listed there. And then all other PLCs uh, restrict access to port 11740. Uh, those are ports that are being used as part of this attack uh, to either send con command and control data or to uh, execute the attack itself. Um, so any any place where your uh, system doesn't explicitly require those ports to be allowed to communicate with those PLCs, um, restrict access and lock down the places the IP addresses to and from they can communicate on those ports to only places where you know that they need to. Uh, you want to also ensure that the engineering workstation from which your engineers are making changes is not allowed to make outbound connections to the internet or to local systems that are outside of the operational technology network. So if they need to get to an enterprise SharePoint, they need to use a different computer for that, a physically different computer on a different network. Um, as part of this attack, the Schneider Net Managed Discovery Service is being leveraged to help discover Schneider PLCs on the network. So you'll want to disable that until it is uh, updated and fixed by Schneider. Um, if you don't have one already, I strongly recommend that you create a industrial control systems focused incident response plan. And that's something that I can help you with as part of you know, critical insights professional services. Um, 
Isolating mission critical SCID systems is also important. That's part of the network segmentation piece that I mentioned earlier. What's a SCID? Well, that is the literal physical metal framework onto which you generally bolt components of a, of a SCADA system. It's like a physical harness that sits in a room and it's what you hang your pumps and valves and everything off of. And you, usually you separate um, functional areas across uh, into individual skids as part of a, a system. So if you have a particular skid that is very vital to your operations, you're going to want to make sure that it's isolated from everything else as much as possible. Hey, and Bjorn and Jerry asked a question in the mm -hmm. chat, and I was going to ask this as well. Uh, you mentioned jumping an air gap. We're going to get to that. Okay. We have a we have a, a talking point at the at the end where we're all going to discuss that. So uh, we'll get there, and we're almost there. Uh, last thing that I want to mention at this point is creating a spare parts inventory uh, for critical system components. Uh, that's hardware, software, firmware, configuration, backups, licensing information. If you need to replace your devices, your, if your PLCs have been overwritten, you want to make sure that you have some hardware uh, that you can swap in, uh, in quickly uh, in order to replace it after it's been compromised. Um, consider the fact that given the level of logistical issues that the world has been having since COVID and everything else, uh, having pre-staging hardware is more important than it was a couple of years ago, uh, especially for IT risks like this. Uh, it is the uh, uh, high technology components that are kind of starting to be, or have started to be harder to get a hold of than others. And while that necessarily, that hasn't necessarily uh, affected the, uh, the controls market, quite as much yet, it's still an issue to, to be concerned about and definitely something that I would uh, have some uh, spare parts in stock to deal with. Um, last, some parting thoughts before we get into the, uh, the Q&A section. Um, ask yourselves, do you have any of these Omron, Schneider Electric, or OPC UA uh, devices in your environments? If so, where and what type? Um, if you needed to collect data, uh, from the environment or validate that the system hadn't been modified. Are you able to do that? Do you, do you have a process in place for that or even a, a, a understanding of how? Uh, if the processes that use these devices or protocols are disrupted, is there a cybersecurity component that could be used to determine uh, whether an attack has recurred and perform root cause analysis? Do you have the monitoring systems in place? Do you have uh, cybersecurity forensic resources that you can draw on either through an incident response retainer or uh, or perhaps some on-staff expertise that could help you do that? Um, do you have an incident response plan that factors in the loss of any of those devices or the temporary um, you know, uh, unavailability of those devices? What monitoring do you have that could ensure that it's not being impacted? Just things to think about, ask yourself in the days ahead as you consider this vulnerability and whether you're at risk. Uh, that brings us to our Q&A. And Jake, back over to you. Well, so did you address the air gap? No, no, that's the first question on the q &A. Oh, well, go ahead. Air gap, talk. Okay, so um, Stuxnet, uh, that attack on the uh, Iranian nuclear plant, well, it, nuclear plants, you will be shocked to hear, very heavily air gapped. Uh, they uh, work really hard to keep malware and internet-based remote attackers out of them. Good. They're kind of a really key target. So there are a wide variety of ways that uh, people have come up with to uh, escape air gaps. And some of them are kind of like more socially socially focused. They're focused on attacking the people and the organization as opposed to the technology. And that might be things like leaving a USB or a set of USB keys strewn throughout the parking lot that have malware on them that uh, the employees of that facility would bring inside because they're curious or they think one of their colleagues dropped it, bring it inside, plug it into one of their machines, and then malware ends up on the network. And that is how uh, Stuxnet let the air gap into the Natanz nuclear plant. That's how it got into the industrial, the air gapped industrial control system at Natanz. Um, this strategy has been used in a variety of other places. Um, the, that uh, some of the uh, one of the, one other example that I could think of is if you are using, for instance, a cellular based um, coordination system uh, for uh, uh, communicating with all of your PLCs. There are isolated uh, uh, cellular networks that uh, are provided by uh, companies like Verizon and AT&T for critical applications. They're highly secured networks. 
The risk is what if somebody steals one of the devices that is allowed formally, like physically steals one of the devices that is allowed to communicate with that network. That would be a, a cell phone SIM card. Well, you can also clone cell phone SIM cards as well. And uh, so even if your private cellular network is air gapped from the rest of the internet, if you can get a SIM card that allows you to uh, get access to that network, either by obtaining it from the vendor or bribing somebody at that organization, the Lapsus gang just had huge success getting uh, credentials and access at it by bribing individuals at Microsoft, NVIDIA, and a few other organizations that allowed them to get way more access than they should have had. Those are the sorts of attacks that air gaps still leave you vulnerable to. It requires more effort, but at the same time, the Lapsus gang appears to have been run by a 17-year-old kid out of the UK, and they were able to achieve remarkable results with social engineering and bribery. So still a major area of concern, even with an air gap. And, and so, you know, one other question, Bjorn, um, uh, is, you know, if, if you don't have PLCs from Schneider or Omron, you know, can you ignore this? I think earlier you said maybe, maybe not. Oh, I would say absolutely not, because this is a toolkit that is designed to be extensible. And normally, for operational security reasons, even the people who are working with this tool would not have access to all of the modules that their government has created. It is scoped exactly to the assignment that they're working on. So there may be other copies of this malware that have plugins for Siemens embedded in them that our people just haven't seen yet. It's also worth noting that the, uh, the malware itself would be a fantastically extensible tool. Should it be leaked as a defender, as an incident responder, I really want it to play with because it would be great for scripting attacks for like my own testing and learning. It would be an incredible educational tool. Frankly, I would love to get a hold of this thing because it'd be so cool to play with. Yeah, until you accidentally burn down a utility. <laughs> well, that's why you Don't build a lab. <laughs> well, you know, I think you brought up a really good point there, Bjorn, about uh, looping back to that air gapping. Uh, you know, one of the ways in is through remote telemetry. And that one's really hard to do anything about. You know, if you have a water utility, you have sensors in wells that let you know what the level of the water is in a well. And that's got to be beamed back to utility to make decisions about how they move water around. Mm -hmm. um, this is one of the easiest ways, I think, to penetrate a utility. But you have to have reasonably physical access. You can't do that from the other side of the world. So to your point about, you know, bribing being part of what we're worried about here and the other point you made too is the same one i tried to bring up in the beginning where it's someone was inside a utility surveilled the componentry in there and designed a very specific kit for them and we've found a total of one that doesn't mean there are no more out there that doesn't mean to your point that you can't repurpose these modules you know to uh you know exploit vulnerabilities and you know rockwell pls whatever so you know, I don't think this can be ignored. I do think that the good thing about this, again, the recommendations are what you should be doing anyway. Yep. So, you know, and is and and CISA made a point out of saying you've got to monitor these environments. That becomes trickier if you are a NERC regulated energy generation utility, because NERC uh, came up with this concept of the electronic security perimeter and certain information cannot cross that boundary. So, you know, that means it's all got to be internal. That means you've basically got to run a sock in your control room, which is not optimal. But yes, monitor, if you can, these technology, Dragos, Armis, uh, we're partnered with Armis. Their device is like a vulnerability detection and UEBA device for uh, control networks and OT networks. Microsoft um, Defender for IoT. Yeah, Microsoft Defender for IoT. Yeah. Yeah, and these are and these are all things that are integrated into our uh, into our SOC. So if you have our managed detection response service and something happens, our um, you know our SOC sees that in the middle of the night and you know, can help you, uh, can help you deal with it right quick. Um, hey, Bjorn, that brings me to a question, you know, if, so let's, so let's say somebody calls you today and says, all right, Bjorn, I need your help. Uh, you know, we have some of these devices, you, you went through some steps here. What would be the first things you did with somebody? 
Um, I would be starting by talking to their, well, okay, it kind of depends on what symptoms they brought to me. Like, are they concerned about a enterprise focused attack, which might be what they would notice first? Are they noticing weird things with their PLCs? You know, how I would attack that would depend on the question that's being brought to me. I wouldn't necessarily know unless they knew already that the PLCs had been attacked. I wouldn't know Mm -hmm. to look there. But if you run those networks, it's worth asking those questions. And uh, so I'd be looking at uh, uh, the event and activity logs on the historian that's associated with the system, and then mm-hmm. looking at uh, you know the uh, inter- any interruptions and in communications with the uh, sensors and process control systems, and then mm-hmm. kind of moving through the the situation from there. Great. Um, and I do want to uh, bring up. So we do have somebody uh, new on our team who can you know, uh, help you talk to Bjorn if that is helpful to you. Uh, her name's Ellie, and we just got her this email address. So Ellie at criticalinsight.com. Um, and I'll put her, uh, her calendar link in the chat. So if you want to book a meeting with her and Bjorn uh, to deal with this stuff, uh, they are happy to help you out. And I have to figure out how to paste it. There you go. It's in the chat. There you go. So you can book a meeting. We have that new new cool calendar thingy. Um, Also worth knowing, you know, we do a whole bunch of stuff. So we do manage detection response, strategic program development. Um, Manage detection response is the 24 seven threat detection investigation. We see it wider, we help you get ready for an incident. Um, And so of course, one of the things that, you know, we've been talking about that's super important with all of this is you need an incident response plan. If you don't have one with everything going on geopolitically, now's a good time to build one. Um, and so make sure that you, uh, you know, you have something there and then on strategic program development side, um, you know, this is where Bjorn works. He can help you, uh, take a look at your devices, take a look at, um, uh, at what you need and, and put together a, um, you know, in a risk assessment, um, or, you know, our pen testing team can, can work with you there. Um, I th- did we lose Bjorn? Bjorn, are you there? Did hitters, did his internet go out? I think we lost Bjorn for a second. Mm, um, hey, Mike. Computers. Yeah, we're just having that kind of day. Um, mm. That's the thing about doing these live. Um, you know, Mike. One, one, one thing that you know, you know, with the geopolitical mess that's going on, yes. you know, you know, we're going to see more of these, right? I mean, we're we're not at the end. The U.S. is going to keep calling these things out, right? Well, we're yeah. So we're so th- this particular thing, which was you know designed, developed by very likely you know gru affiliated actors mm-hmm. right this is this is nation state stuff so we're going to keep finding these things the the real thing in my view to worry about for most of the businesses the government agencies everything are are the proxy actors the ones that are operating outside the government confines. Mm-hmm. So, you know, about the Ukrainian IT army and all the damage they're doing and anonymous is hacking Russia. Um, eventually that's really going to get under the skin of a lot of people and whether or not it is directed by the state, there's going to be plenty of volunteer. In fact, they've already got the, the, the cyber Z army in Russia right. getting ready to punch back here. So that actually to me is going to be more concerning because that kind of thing we don't you know uh hack into gru systems and find their malware before it's deployed this stuff is all a surprise it's uncoordinated it's asymmetric that so that to me that's the bigger issue right now finding kits like this means that the the fingerprints of the the state are there that's additionally a bad thing so yeah it's not going to stop yeah. And uh, sorry for dropping out briefly. Uh, the uh, on that point, it's also worth noting that once things like this are known to exist, they tend to either escape into the wild and get used by criminals as well as uh, intelligence agencies. And they also, um, even if they don't escape into the wild, they are often replicated by people who simply never thought of that idea, but have the capability to build something similar to it. And and Bjorn, um, so two things here. One is at the end of all of our events, we give folks a survey. I'm gonna put the survey in the chat. A reminder, when you take the survey, uh, at the end, you have a chance, you can either ask for a gift card or you can donate the value of the gift card to uh, Girls Who Code. So we really appreciate that. And yes, all of my links are safe links. We use Survey Monkey, so you can even recognize the URL. Um, we're gonna go a little bit over time here because Jordan just asked a really important 
important question. So if you got to go, take the survey on your way out, and you'll get a recording of Bjorn's answer to this question. Um, Bjorn, what are you seeing for the time requirement to monitor SCADA telemetry systems as per your recommendations? More than one FTE, are you finding it common for utilities to outsource the oversight requirement to a third party? I'm I'm seeing outsourcing a lot more commonly than I'm seeing the uh, uh, you know somebody doing it on board. Um, I would say that uh, if you're just using one FTE, that means that you're vulnerable whenever they're sick or go on vacation. Um, and it's probably more like you need to have people on shift working around the clock doing this. Um, it's something that I think is not only not only should you be looking at either hiring or outsourcing people to do this, but you should also be literally giving your engineers and operators some cybersecurity education so that they can think about what to look for in their normal uh, course of business as they're doing their work. What sorts of things should they be watching out for? Um, so it's it's an educational and training piece for the operators as well as a, a problem to solve on a, on a technical and uh, logistical perspective as far as getting eyes on the monitoring itself. Um, so yeah, bit, bit, of, bit of both there, but I see outsourcing as being probably the more likely solution because it's a lot cheaper than hiring two or three FTEs. Yep. Yeah, and real sure. quickly, because I got to jump to a board meeting here. Um, so for 24-7 coverage, which you got to have, a uh, single FTE is not going to do it. And in fact, if you're really going to run a SOC operation and you're going to accommodate things like, you know, sickness, you know, vacations, things like that, it's more like 10 to 12 FTEs to do it. So it becomes prohibitively expensive right off the bat. You know, you can do it just to have log aggregation and put somebody's eyes on that, but it's, it's, it's not going to be the same. Yeah. Yeah. All right, everybody. Um, yes. So uh, Jerry asked, will we send out the deck? Yes, Jerry, we will send out the deck. So this afternoon, we're going to send out the deck. We're going to send out a uh, Word document and we're going to send out the YouTube link. Uh, and we really, and afternoon, give afternoon West Coast time. We'll take a little extra time on that afternoon thing. All right, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. Mike and Bjorn, thank you. Mike's internet, not thank you. Um, no. And uh, And have a good day, everybody. Thank you so much. Yep. Bye-bye. Thanks, folks.